take a look at our, our handout and we'll go through the handout for different various uh, processes. And uh, we'll start with the uh, first page. Okay. Again, handout starts with our diagnostic criteria. We have peak currents, the peak current as a function of scan rate and the peak current over the cathodic peak current. And so we've talked about all of these in, in, in a slightly different way. Uh, the peak current and the cathodic peak current, we can normalize by the square root of the scan rate. And normally if we had no chemical reaction and it was reversible, remember the cathodic peak current over the square root of the scan rate should be a constant. And so by looking at this graph we can see some indications of whether or not uh, we've got some chemical process. Our characteristic time, we'll call T sub crit C for characteristic. For uh, scan rates that we can uh, normally access, we're going to be 10.01 to 10 to the fifth volts per second, so we're talking about three seconds to 0.3 microseconds as we just discussed. Uh, maybe faster if we really do the experiment correctly. So here we have a nice range. We've got about a 10 to the, 10 to the seventh full scan rate, or a 10 to the seventh uh, range in the time. So just cyclic voltammetry alone gives us a nice uh, wide range. Mostly when we talk about chemical reactions, we want to use dimensionless parameters. We want to combine the time scales of our two experiments. And so we can get unique curves for particular experiments. And so we're going to incorporate not only the, the chemical reaction rate constant, we're going to incorporate our time, con our characteristic time of our experiment. So for cyclic voltammetry, T sub C is RT over FV. And so K over V over RT times RT over F is going to be equal to a term we'll call lambda for first order chemical reactions. And so let's take a look at that. As K becomes very large, our lambda becomes very large. So keeping V constant, we can think of a large lambda as being a very rapid chemical reaction, very large rate constant. So large values of lambda generally refer to large values of the rate constant. Or we can think of lambda as a proxy for the reciprocal of the scan rate. So typically K does not change. What we change is the value of the scan rate to explore lambda. So for a particular system, by going from small values of the scan rate, lambda is very large, and large values of the scan rate, lambda becomes very small. So we'll typically vary lambda in an experiment by changing the scan rate. Lambda can change as a function of the rate constant by looking at, say, a collection of um, related molecules, or perhaps by changing the solution conditions, we can change uh, K. For second order reactions, we're going to have K times the, the bulk concentration of the reacting species times the critical time. And so again, uh, the same sort of situation. By making the product KC large, we can make lambda <laughs> large as well. All right. Let's take a look for the irreversible C, irreversible C, irreversible case. And what we're going to show here are what they call zone diagrams. And they illustrate to you in one particular graph the range of behaviors that we might expect to see during an experiment. On the bottom of the diagram, you see the x axis is the logarithm of the, the uh, the lambda value that we just talked about. Okay, so this is lambda here, right here. And as you can see, as lambda becomes larger than, say, 10, we're in the situation where the reaction is essentially chemically controlled. When lambda becomes less than 10, we're in a situation where the reaction is essentially electrochemically controlled. And so, 
if you can see at that point where lambda is less than minus, uh, less than, I should say, 0.1, not 10. So less than 0.1, uh, we're in a situation we'll call pure diffusion control. So if this is our reaction A to B and B to products, DP is a zone that we'll call d uh, pure diffusion case. In that case, we can look at that and see, for example, IPA over IPC is equal to one, just like a normal reaction. Uh, and it would have the same kind of characteristic as a reversible electron transfer, no difference. In KP, where the K value is significantly greater than about 0.3 or so, we're in a zone in which the reaction is in what they call a pure kinetic zone. In this case, let's look at the y-axis, which is the peak position uh, multiplied, peak position minus E0 multiplied by F over RT. So again, this is a dimensionless form of the situation. F over RT has units of reciprocal volts, and the EP minus E0 has units of volts. And so we, again, allowing us to draw one single graph. As the EP will shift, and it shifts a little bit uh, positive as we increase the value of lambda. And you can see that shifts in a straight line, uh, a straight logarithmic line in that particular case. So if we take a look at it, we'll see that for 25 degrees C, the um, or for any particular case, the peak position is equal to E0 minus 0.78 times RT over F plus RT over 2F to the natural log of lambda. IPA is going to be zero in this particular case. What about zone KD? Well, KD is less easy to characterize by a single sets of parameters. It's going to have a very variable value depending on the exact value of lambda that we're looking at. EP does not shift in a reproducible way or in a way that's linear with, time, with the scan rate. Uh, also, the peak current over the anodic and cathodic peak current is not going to be equal to one or zero. It's going to have some range of values. I think to best to illustrate that, I want to use the computer screen in the simulation. Unfortunately, it turns out that the simulation that we're using um, the graphics don't show up on the main monitor here. So what I think we'll do is I'll have you look on the monitor here, and if you can't see it very well, we'll maybe just come up and look at it. But we'll see what happens. Let's take a look. First of all, this is a program that you can download, and I would encourage you to download it and play with it. You'll see a lot of these effects that we're talking about. It's called SimEC, it's a DOS program. It allows you, uh, without too much work, to set up various types of EC processes. It doesn't do CE processes and it doesn't do um, um, catalytic processes that we're gonna talk about later, but it'll give us some ability to understand the EC processes. There are, we have a, chem, a simulation program in our laboratory that allows you to simulate all those different processes it's a little bit harder to use, but uh, you can, if you want to come and use it, you can, you can try to use it. There are some programs available on the internet. There's one program called Polar, which a guy, uh, an Australian guy is selling, uh, which seems to do some nice things, but he wants $100 for it, for the full version. The stuff that you can get from Polar is right on this same simulation here, so I wouldn't bother with it unless you're gonna pay for $100. But let's take a look at SimEC. Again, you can download that. And this is a, a DOS-based program. And what you'll do, you can see on the initial screen, you can see uh, settings. And for, let's take a look at our settings, first of all. What we can change here is the rate constant. And we can go from, say, any value from, say, 0.01 up to about 50 under these particular conditions. We have a scan rate of one volt per second, and we'll leave our scan rate at one volt per second the whole time, just so we, we don't have to worry about it too much. Let's make our rate constant to a large value, 50 reciprocal seconds. 
and let's simulate it. Now, here's the problem, but you can see on the screen, I think. Can you uh, actually get the camera on that, Rob? Yeah, we're doing it right now. Okay. Anyway, let's take a look, and uh, it may not show up even so, but the what looks to be reversible here is a, re a reference voltammogram, okay? So it's the voltammogram that we would observe without the chemical step. And so I've uh, just put, put that on there for you, so you to see what it looks like. The other way, and that's kind of a, got a dotted line. You can see it's a little dotted, perhaps. The other one with the solid line is our EC reaction. Notice the anodic peak current is missing, as we'd expect. It looks like there might be a little peak there, but remember, we're not seeing a, a regular peak. That's just, you can think of that as kind of a sigmoidal wave. We're dropping off, and uh, all of the O is undergoing a continuous depletion by diffusion. So instead of seeing a reverse wave here, we're continuing to deplete the value of O all the way to here, and then we've got a kinetic re return to, to zero. So there's no R there for that reaction to take place. Notice the peak current has slightly increased, and that's because the peak width it turns out to be a little narrower than the normal peak width. Not much, but that's why it's a little bit larger. The same amount of charge is flowing, but it's occurring at a, over a narrower region of time, and so it's a little sharper and a little bit higher for that reason. Uh, and you see the shift to the negative. It's not a very large shift because of the value isn't much larger than, than zero, than one. So let's try a different value. Problem is we can't go too much. Um, well, let me see what happens here. I've changed something. Let's try it. Ah, darn it. Ah, let's, let's see. Ah, let's try this again. All right, we're going to do the simulation. So what we're going to do is we're going to change the simulation, and we're going to change the simulation so that we have a, rate con a large rate constant for B. Let's say, let's make it 500. And it's going to complain because because of the way the simulation works, we have to have a fairly large value of um, number of points. We have to slice up our time scale very fine to allow this diffusion and chemical process to occur in the calculation. We're going to go up here and change the kinetic model to EC simulation instead of a, what was an, a DISP-1 reaction. So now we've gone from 50 to 500 in the simulation. Let's see what happens. Okay, and you probably can see that the peak has shifted significantly positive from before. And so we're definitely in this, what they call the KP zone, pure kinetic diffusion zone. Let's drop the value back down to, um, to 
to, uh, let's go to point, let's go to five. So we went from 500 to 50 to five. And let's take, let's take a look at, let's think about our scan. We're, we're at RT um, over FV, and RT over FV is 38 reciprocal volts. Uh, so our 30, it's about 38 seconds, uh, 38 seconds is our, is our characteristic time. Uh, no. RT. Right, right, right. One over 38 seconds. Okay, so now we're getting, now we're looking at five uh, reciprocal seconds for our kinetic time, and notice what's happened. The peaks have almost become superimposable. Uh, the anodic peak current no longer is zero. We've got a little bit of an increase there, and so we've got some reaction occurring during the time scale of the process, and our anodic peak current illustrates that. So that would be in this KD zone that we've talked about. Let's make the value of 0.5, drop it by another factor of 10. Okay, I've, I've made it, I made the original data dotted so you can see the difference. The dots there are what you'd expect for 0.5 where we've got some wave and if you weren't real careful you might look at that and say oh it looks normal but then if you look at the IPA or IPC you would see that it's not normal. You're still about 80% of what you should be there. And so you would see that that would not be quite right. And the way to tell that would be to go to different scan rates as you change the scan rate up by a factor of 10, you would now be in a zone that would be more like DP. And if you exchange the scan rate lower by a factor of 10, you'd be in the, in the KP region. All right. Let's, let's just try that. If we do that, we'll say, let's take our simulation and pretend that we're actually doing an experiment. If we change the scan rate, and we look at that uh, IP over IPC value and say, oh, it's too low. What happens if I make my scan rate a little faster? So let's go to 10 volts per second. In this situation, we've changed the lambda value. And it's the same lambda value that we had for a, a kinetic term of uh, five. With, but at one volt per second. So going to 10 volts per second in a, in a, a K value of 0.5 gives us the same lambda value. So now our, I'm sorry, it went the other way. We've, we've changed the scan rate to be much faster so the lambda value has dropped. What I meant to do was the opposite. Let's, uh, let's go to our, our uh, scan rate of um, 0.1 volt per second. And the things are different because they're um, Baby. There we go. So dropping it down to from point from one to point one, we've now we've got a lambda value that's the same as for a, a k value of of uh, five and one. 
so the same 0.5 and 1, so we, we can retain that thing. So you can see by changing the scan rate, we can explore the kinetic space that we've talked about, our zone diagram here. And if we go back and we simulate so that our scan rate, let's take it back to uh, one volt per second. And let's set our um, rate constant for B going to C, or uh, B going to, to Z to 0 0.05. Now we should be in basically in the pure diffusion case. All right, and what you can see now is that for all intents and purposes, we uh, have a, uh, the dotted line again is our undisturbed data, and you can see there's one little dot down there, and so we're almost about, probably about 99 or 98 percent of the way to reversibility under those conditions. So going from about 500 to 0 0.05, we see that change from pure kinetics to pure diffusion in that particular case. Okay. All right. Well, I guess we're um, probably at the point where we could stop to take a break. So why don't we stop here and take a break. Okay, the, um, the next page of the handout <coughs> illustrates the effect of what happens when the initial chemical react or the initial electrochemical reaction is not completely reversible. In other words, we have a quasi-reversible initial reaction. In this case, the zone diagram becomes significantly more complicated. It, however, uh, becomes e equivalent to the initial zone diagram when the heterogeneous rate constant becomes sufficiently rapid. Now, if you look at this, you'll see that there is a, um, a lambda value plotted along one axis, the y-axis and the uh, uh, capital lambda, and then a small letter lambda for the, on the uh, x-axis. Capital letter lambda is equal to the uh, term of the K0, divided by the diffusion coefficient and times the scan rate to the one-half power. So in other words, a large values of lambda, of capital lambda, indicate rapid heterogeneous electron transfer rate constants, large values of the rate constant, or uh, relatively slow scan rates. Whereas for the small letter lambda, it has the same meaning as before. So if we look up here on our large value of log lambda, values above two, we're essentially going to have the same sort of zone diagram as we had with the uh, initial, p the previous page for the reversible case. So anything above uh, about two, uh, one in fact is about ready, to, is right in that z zone diagram. Below those two points, below that point in the capital lambda, we have a situation in which the, well we have a quasi-reversible zone. And in this case the chemical reaction still is no longer um, effective, affecting us even there because the, the rate constant is still quite slow. In this case, then if we go even slower, then we have a zone IR, which again acts as an irreversible electron transfer step. Uh, again, no effect really of the chemical process. We have a couple new terms, K sub G, which is um, it's sort of a mixed case where we have kinetics, a general kinetic case is what it stands for. There is uh, kinetics from both the homogeneous reaction and the heterogeneous reaction. Obviously that's going to be the most difficult to theoretically treat. Uh, simulations are very good for that. And K sub I, which would be the kinetics with irreversible uh, electron transfer or irreversible kinetic 
That's an irreversible case, but with kinetics. Notice also in the zones, in the zone on the uh, upper left, there is a, the slope of the peak position versus scan rate, and you see it's at zero. And that's what we expect, because in that case, it were irreversible electron transfer process. In the pure kinetic effect case, uh, the peak will shift by a factor of 29.6 millivolts per decade change in the scan rate divided by N. And that's what we saw when we just did the CVs. You can verify that. You can change the scan, or the scan rate by a factor of 10 in this KP region, and you'll see that shift of peak current by negative 29.6 millivolts over N. In the irreversible region, we get a peak shift that is now 59 millivolts over N because we've both got, we've got irreversible uh, electron transfer kinetics and irreversible chemical kinetics. And we can kind of get a flavor of that. I'm not gonna go through the whole region, but we can look at sort of the general kinetic region by going and changing our rate constant for the electron transfer, which here b before was set to be reversible, and in order to set it to be reversible, I set it to a very large number, which was 10 to the fifth centimeters per second. Let's change our rate constant to say 0.1. Well, let's make it 0.01. Okay, here we had our pure um, kinetic We'd be in the, we'd be in the uh, zone which would be QR here because th we've, we've made the chemical process very slow, small lambda is small. And so we'll kind of maintain that as a kind of a, as a, a, a test point. And what we'll do is we'll change Now our point to, so our homogeneous rate constant is 0.5. And remember in that case we were in the, we would be in the K0 region if we had no quasi-reversible process, but now we're gonna be, we're going from QR into the KG point in our, in our simulation. Oops, let's go back. When I first wrote this program, we were running it on the original IBM PCs and it took about 15 minutes to do the calculation that we just did. It took about 15 minutes to do that same calculation on that, so look. That's the difference. Here we see the effect. Now the, uh, this is the quasi-reversible wave. For comparison, now we've changed our, our uh, value a little bit more. Notice the peak really hasn't shifted too much, but we're in the KG region. This would be the most difficult to treat by looking at theoretical curves. We'd actually want to do simulations to treat it properly. And let's go into now the um, what we'd call the uh, KP, KI region by making our rate constant now much faster. Oh, shoot. the quasi-reversible again, and then we have the irreversible because of the kinetic case on top of it. Now so the peak has not shifted as much as we saw before because we're now in this case of I region, and so the peak shift is not as, as great, is not as apparent as we'd expect. 
we can make our wave close to being irreversible. Let's see if we can try that. Let's change our rate constant to a much smaller value. And uh, there's our result. Now we're in definitely in the IR region. We're, we've dropped from the KI region where we were into the IR region as you'd expect. Now the shift is negative because that's what we see for irreversible kinetics, but it's kind of, kind of counterbalanced a little bit by the chemical process. Okay. So you can see it's a little bit more tricky when we have quasi-reversibility, but that's the general, just generally what we're going to see. In order to get the proper reaction conditions, we have to change the scan rate, but the changing the scan rate may change us from reversibility to quasi-reversibility. So these, these curves are never quite as simple to understand as we'd like. So that's why one of the reasons simulation really is very helpful in this case. You can try to use the curves to figure things out initially, but oftentimes you'll have to resort then to simulations to to make it work. The next case I don't have uh, simulations for. I wish I did. It's a little tricky to use because of, the, because of the way the calculation is. It actually becomes very complicated. Uh, and it's hard to get a, accurate results, really. But here's the E sub R, C sub I prime. In other words, we've got an irreversible catalytic process under these conditions. And so we've got A to B, and then some catalytic process returning it. Now we can have another reaction internally doing this, but we don't really have to supply another reaction. We can just think of that as, as some catalytic return. Some internal uh, oxidant is making B back to, to A. And you can see the sweep voltammograms for various values of lambda. Now lambda is going to be, small lambda is going to be our kinetic parameter. It's going to change now. And it's going to be dependent on the concentration of our catalysts, okay? Whatever is in there to do the transformation. So K prime times the catalyst bulk concentration. And we see here the peak current, which is, a, is a plotted as a current function. And what they've done is they've divided it through by lambda to the one half power. And so that allows us to see more on the same graph what's happening. So what happens when lambda becomes very large? Let's look at that curve. And that's number 11. That's the one right at the bottom. And if you look at that, you'll see that it's just a sigmoidal shape curve. Right? But notice we've divided our peak. We've divided by our current function by lambda to the one half power. So in fact, that sigmoidal curve would be way off scale if we didn't do that. So that's not a small current, that's a very large current that we're seeing there. But because of the way we plotted it, to maintain it correctly, it's going to be a large value. What's, does that make sense? It should make sense to you because we've, what we're doing is the catalytic, catalyst, catalysis process is very efficient. We're returning the reaction to back to the original point very rapidly. So you'd expect a very large current to flow, and that's what we see. As we decrease the capability of the catalyst, we see the current now becomes more and more like a normal voltammogram. And at one, you see the catalytic process is quite, uh, quite a bit slower. And now the current will have dropped, and you'll see a normal looking peak voltammogram. Notice the current. Current here, they have a plot for the current that depends on the amount of catalytic process. Now in many cases, what they'll do is they'll add enough catalysts to make sure that the reaction is a pseudo first order process. In other words, there's always a large amount of C star Z in the system so that we can treat this as a first order uh, reaction. Okay.
I should also point out um, there is a limiting current for this particular case. Uh, what has I got here? So in this case, when K prime is very large, uh, we can we can actually, or C sub Z is very large, we can make a uh, limiting current appear if we hold the time scale at a long enough time scale, and that would be this limiting current we see on the on the curve there. As you'd expect, larger the value of K prime C Z, the more current we're going to get out of the system. So you can think of this as kind of a mass transfer coefficient. It's not a mass transfer coefficient, it's a, but it's equivalent to a mass transfer coefficient in this sigmoidal curves. All right, what do, what do we say when we do a zone diagram? Nope, we don't have that. That's for the next one. I was trying to look at my notes and see what I meant to say there. Um, I just was long, I think I was drawing what the curve should basically look like. And in real current scales, the curves would look something like that for CVs. And then if you had, as you drop the efficiency of the catalyst, they would drop somewhat. And then you would see at some point a normal looking CV out of the system. So these would be high catalyst, lower and lower.